Hi, uh, my name is Richard. I work for GDA and I'm doing a video which is a use case of how high performance computing can be used in high frequency trading. So let's imagine that we're in the front office of investment bank and we're running a market making strategy. Um, we have one in front of us. It was written in Python. Now, this is kind of public information that I'm giving you. So th there's, this is, this is a really kind of public basic strategy, um, that uses short term alpha. But, um, what we do is we use the Hamilton Jacobi and Bellman equations, which I'll kind of explain in, in optimal control theory, the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation gives a necessary and sufficient condition for optimality of a control with respect to a loss function. It is in general a non-linear partial differential equation in the value function, which means its solution is the value function itself. Once the solution is known, it can be used to obtain the optimal control by taking the maximizer or minimizer of the Hamilton involved in the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. So We've got the, um, what we've done is we've modeled, we've used this um, dynamic programming equation here to model the dynamics of the limit order book, the microstructure of the limit order book. And as you can see, um, it's put here. Now, as this is nonlinear, this has to be transformed into a linear partial difference equation. And then we'll use a mesh in a grid to solve this using crank Nicholson. So again, this is a, a kind of mesh here where along one axis, we've got the time dimension and along the other axis, we've got the space dimension. Now, what will happen for each point, you'll calculate each point and then go along and then it will start again and you'll calculate each point. There's the kind of explicit implicit, and then there's an average of the two, which is called the crank Nicholson. So if we look at this Python code here, it's, it's just got one little snag to it. And the fact is that you've got to extract all these parameters from the market data. You've got to use statistical methodology to extract your, um, to extract all your parameters. So we we can see, you know, that the time equals sixty. Well, in a you know in a really liquid market, that time could that's saying sixty seconds here, but that could be five seconds. And they're saying, you know, well, what's their total volume of the market? They're saying that they they they're twenty percent of the market. So that that again is unrealistic. So what will happen is we'll solve this equation um, using that mesh grid. We'll loop through the entire mesh and then solve it. And we'll produce this optimal surface. Now this is in three dimensions. This is the sell side, this is the buy side. This is the time dimension, this is the inventory. And this is a short-term alpha. The short-term alpha is basically a short-term trend. So, um, a, a, you know, a movement in the price, a short-term trend, we, we know, within a couple of seconds. So the trick in market making is to get in the market just long enough to capture that short term alpha. You don't want to get in and out so quickly that you miss it either. So this will kind of tell you what action to take. And the, the kind of thing that you've got control over is your inventory level. So where to place, when to place the limit orders. So as you can see at the end of big time T, the inventory is always going to be zero. So as we um, take our actions within this time scale, we'll also in parallel be t taking using statistical methods to figure out what the parameters are going to be and then feed that into the, you know, so solving the, so solving, finding a solution to the equation and then working out what the next surface will be for the next 60 seconds, et cetera, et cetera and so on and so on and so on. But the, the, the problem we find is that as we change the parameters, the equation becomes exponentially, it takes exponentially longer to solve. So one way we kind of resolve this is by using high performance computing techniques. And 
what we're going to do is we're going to take a methodical approach. We're going to concentrate on the Intel architecture. Um, the Intel chips that we're going to be concentrating on are going to be a few years old, but most of the stuff is still relevant. So I'm going to kind of skip over the stuff that's not relevant, the stuff that's changed, and I'm going to kind of focus on the stuff that's still the same. Now, what we're going to do is first, we're going to focus on vectorization. Then after we focus on vectorization, we're going to focus on multi-threading. Then after we focus on multi-threading, we're going to focus on proper, correct um, memory management. And then after that, we're going to focus on distributed computing. So let's just basically give you an intro. So we've got vectorization here. And this is ensuring that all our loops are properly vectorized. So in other words, our loops are using the vector registers. Then we've got multi-threading. So this is ensuring that there's, and we're taking, we're handling any race conditions that would occur. And then we've got cluster computing and distributed computing as well. So those are three kind of main prongs, uh, which we're going to try and improve it. And the, the example we're going to look at is going to be a stencil example, which is highly relevant. Um, so we kind of see here, here's a stencil. And um, so the same kind of thing, you know, we, we use stencils for a number of reasons. We can use them in machine learning for edge detection, or we can use them to solve partial differential equations. So they literally are. So when we look at the kind of relationship between, um, especially if we're looking over a period of time and we're looking at how the kind of performance of computers has improved, and we look at Moore's law, um, if, if we look at the frequency, that has kind of ab ab obeyed that law. But we look at it in mid 2000, it kind of plateaued because, you know, we, we got to this kind of point where we couldn't improve the frequency anymore. We couldn't cool down the processors anymore. We kind of reached a, a wall. But if you look at the number of transistors, that has kind of carried on on that trend. So you know, overclocking isn't the answer. Plus, we can look at pipelining, and you know, it, it, you know, we can increase or we can superscale the execution. But again, we're going to kind of run into out of order execution and the memory wall issues. So we are limited by the data locality and the access pattern in our application. So there is an unbounded kind of growth opportunity, but it is not automatic. We really got to look um, for all the types of, or ways of vectorizing our code. We've got to kind of think in the context of linear algebra, how, how are we going to rephrase this kind of problem into a linear algebra problem and therefore get the, 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 the vector registers to handle it and then the threads and distributed computing, etc., etc. So par parallelism is the path forward and we've known that for a while. And there's there are many different approaches to doing that. I mean, we've got FPGAs, we've got GPUs, but what I'd really like to do for the moment and for this video is focus on CPUs and specifically the Intel architecture. We're not going to talk about AMD because AMD um, have got small or rather smaller vector registers. Um, Intel have in general, well, have always got some, some of the Intel CPUs have got larger vector registers and that's really what I'm kind of interested in. Okay, so here's um, you know, this this is going back a few years. So you know this Intel Xeon Phi processor. This has been discontinued in two thousand and eight eighteen, um, but it's it's still a fantastic um, it's still a fantastic processor. It's capable of three T flops per second, and there's a four hundred ninety gigabytes per second bandwidth.
So this is the, the scalar instructions and these are the vector instructions. So from single instruction, multiple data, this is going to be a single instruction, multiple data, okay? That means that with one instruction, with one clock cycle, we can add multiple numbers in the vector register in one go, depending on what the vector length is, as opposed to having to do them one at a time. So that's what we're really trying to avoid. So uh, this is kind of going through future, what we're going to be talking about later, um, how we're going to handle the cache, how we're going to facilitate data um, reuse, and how we're going to optimize the RAM for streaming. So, well, depending on the, the, the use case. So our, our use case is the stencil. So we're going to stick it, stick with that for the moment. And then we're going to talk about the design patterns in the clusters, etc. And cluster in distributed computing. Okay, we can see from here that the um, these are the vector registers for Intel, and we can see that they started off at 64-bit, and then they've gone to 128-bit, and then 256-bit, and now they're 512-bit. And we're looking at how to vectorize our code. A lot of the time, if you're to use a for loop and you're to use it like this, there's going to be automatic vectorization. Um, there is explicit vectorization. Um, but you'd need to look up the Intel intrinsic guide to work out what that is and we're not really interested in that So we're going to skip that. So let's talk about automatic vectorization If we're going to use the Intel compiler, which is the Intel C++ compiler, which is the IEC PC compiler and We're to put this little tag at the end Q opt report We'll get a report an auto vec dot opt report come out and that will tell us that will show us yes this loop has been this loop has been vectorized so that's that's a really kind of good thing to to run um, and you can then get an output and then we can kind of look at that output and we can see if 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 we can see for ourselves if it's been vectorized there are limitations to automatic vectorization. It only does the innermost loop. So if you've got nested loops, it'll only do the innermost loop. There has to be a known no number of iterations. There has to be no vector dependence. And the functions within that loop must be SIMD enabled. So the pragma directive that we will use in our code to ensure that we get automatic vectorization will be pragma OMP SIMD to override. If we want to target a specific process architecture we can do that or we can target multi-architecture dispatches as well okay so that's what i'm talking about is that we can when we're compiling we can put these specific tags in there and that will compile our code but if our code's already got the pragma directives in there then it's now future proof because any future architecture that comes out we can just target as so we won't have to rewrite the code now autom automatically vectorized loops may be complex so we've got this loop here this is a single loop and this is the newton's law universal gravity so it's kind of complex but this is going to be automatically vectorized which is great now also if we want to you know go into this in more detail if we want to have loops with simd enabled functions and then we've got to look at failed vectorization due to compiler decisions. So, so sometimes you have to guide your compiler. So here we've got um, two nested loops here, and we're vectorizing the. We're making sure that vectorization happens by putting this pre, um, pragma OMP SIMD on the outer loop. So here are the kind of vectorization directives, and 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 this is just. A really kind of fast, you know, I'm just kind of flying through this. You can, you know, all this information is publicly available, and I'll kind of put the links below to show you where you can kind of get access to everything. Um, but the, the, the main thing that I'm trying to get across is how we use um, high performance computing using a stencil, and there, there are other kind of ways of doing it as well. So, you, you know, for each 
stencil has to have its um, in initial boundary conditions and you can set up different borders and that way you can uh, use distributed computing more but for this case we're, we're just going to start off with a vectorization here's here's a you know pragma omp declare simd so this is in a separate file and then we've got pragma omp simd so this is an simd function so, and the SIMD enable functions can also be complex. Okay, so there's there's a lot of power here um, in this. So this is a true vector dependence. So this thing here is impossible to vectorize. This because it's depending on the last value here. So this is the dependence on the previous element. There is no dependence on the previous element in the pre in, the, in this one. So this is safe to vectorize. And this is an edge case at the bottom. Okay. So in this example, we're using a stencil and we're using it for edge detection. Okay. Um, here's your set stencil. Okay. And it will loop through every single pixel and it will use all the different it will this this is a stencil it'll basically use okay now this can also be used as discussed in Crank Nicholson partial differential equations solving partial partial differential equations so for vectorization the first step is that in the innermost loop put pragma omp simd and this ensures vectorization of your stencil code and we can see we've we've gained a performance of the original code had a performance of 2.3, um, I think, operations per second, um, ops per second, and we've increased that to 17. So let's now have a look how we're going to increase that to 90 now. So we've got a partitioning data set between threads and processes. Um, this is the difference between threads and processes I'll just quickly talk about. We've got a process, we have to do message um, message passing and we want to get information from one thread to another we'll have to use mutexes okay so one of the we're going to use the open mp there are numerous kind of frameworks for for using threads but we're going to use the open mp we can specifically use the entire implicate implementation of open mp and one of the reasons we're going to do that is we're going to, anything we use is going to be the Intel version. So we're using an Intel C++ compiler here. We're also going to use the Intel OMP library. We're also going to use the Intel MPI library. Um, so we can see that we're putting this, um, this, this kind of tag in here, Q open MP. And then we're setting the number of threads to five and then we're running the code. So this is all kind of command line stuff. Now, as we're running all these loops in parallel, we don't, we want to take care of any kind of um, race conditions. So one of the best ways of doing that is using a Pragma OMP parallel and this Pragma directive Pragma OMP four. So that will take care of any race conditions. Um, these are the kind of loops scheduling modes in OMP. We've got static, dynamic, and guided. And we'll just quickly go through. This is, this, you know, we're going back to the same use case, which is a stencil multi-threading. And we want to go back to, okay, so here we put a Pragma OMP parallel four, and then we've got our Pragma OMP SIMD from before. So th those combinations of those two directives have we've managed to you know improve the performance up to 90 ops per second, which is excellent. Okay, so now we're going to talk about kind of memory management, and that's not where we get the the real kind of game. But but one thing we have to be aware of is when we look at this, we can see that if if we try and do a ratio between the, the you know the number of flops we're processing per second versus the kind of memory access. If we get a ratio, this is a ratio of 43. 
So if we get if, if that ratio is over 50, then we can say that our application is compute bound. We have a compute bound application. If it's less than 50, then we have a bandwidth bound application. So it's important to kind of just on the back of an envelope, um, just do that quick calculation, work out what that ratio is and figure out. You can also kind of use a roof line model, which is what um, there's little tools that, that are available that allow us to kind of look at that. This is the kind of RAM streaming. This is DDR streaming. Here is the um, ABX 512 register. And here's your arithmetic intensity along the bottom. And here's your performance on the side. So when looking at the memory hierarchy, there are kind of a number of different um, memories in, in the computer. There's the L1 cache, there's the L2 cache. If we look at the L1 cache, that generally takes four to five cycles. This is L2 taking 17 to 18. The second it goes to RAM, you're looking at 100 cycles. So it's really kind of best um, for this specific use case, because we're not dealing with a lot of information to keep everything in the L1 cache, but there may be instances where we're dealing with a lot of data and we've got to use the RAM. So then we'd have to use the streaming, the, 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 the RAM streaming that we talked about earlier. So this is a two-way architecture hub, which has, and this is, so I don't really, really talk about this architecture too much because everything, all, all of this, everything's now being changed as we're, you know, we're moving to more to a kind of system on a chip um, kind of design where the RAM and the memory, etc., is all getting closer and closer to the CPU. So this is kind of more historical than anything else. So I don't want to spend too much time focusing on this, but I want to talk about the the the, the, the main kind of um, what we can do to 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 you know look at the caches. So I want to talk about really we'll talk about locality and space and time. Okay, so this is locality and space. And this, you know, a minimal block of data transferred between your memory and your cache is 65 bytes long in the Intel architecture, aligned on 64 byte boundaries in memory. We have eight double precision values, we have 16 single precision values. Okay. We choose the loop order to maintain unit stride memory access. Okay. And that's it. And so this is the, you know, this is the top kind of, when we talk about locality and space, this is what we're talking about, unit stride memory access. So all this memory is, is kind of next to each other. It's, it's not kind of disparate like it is in, the, in, in this. So if we were to look at this multiplication, we can tell, we can tell that this matrix, this matrix to matrix multiplication, um, if, if we kind of change the order in which the different rows and columns are multiplied, we'll get a better performance. Um, if, if we look at an array of, of, of structures or a structure of arrays, so here this is an, you know, an array of structures and this is suboptimal. So when, when we look at a structure of arrays, this is optimal because this guarantees unit stride access, which is locality and space. Okay, so there's the principle. For best spatial locality, order loops to get unit stride. Okay. Now, the other issue is locality in time. And, you know, when we talk about locality in space and time, I'm going to come back to these topics. Here we're talking to it in, you know, in terms of Intel, but we could also be talking about it in, in terms of in sparsity when we're talking about back propagation and when we're trying to learn in machine learning and how we can get neuromorphic supremacy. Um, and through spike neural networks, and then we'll talk about photonics, and that's really the future of, of technology. That's where the future lies. Um, so we can get you know neural networks or deep neural networks that can learn you know a billion times faster than we can, because our our spikes take the order of a millisecond to run, while these photonic spikes take picoseconds. So what what's that saying? Is that saying well that can learn? You know if we have we had a brain that used photonics. That will basically be able to learn a billion times quicker than we can, billions of times quicker than we can. So this is spatial. Forgive me for that kind of digression, but now we're going to look at locality in space. And what we're trying to achieve in locality in space is we're trying to increase our cache hits rate. 
So we can see on this first example here, our cash hit rate without tiling is zero. Okay, when we include tiling, our cash hit rate is 50%. So the yellow ones, we've got loads of yellow ones here. All right, and that's great. These are the cash misses, these are the cash hits, and we've achieved that by going from this code, we've got two nested for loops, but we've now got three nested for loops and we've used a tile, okay. This is another methodology, but we haven't improved the, the, the performance. So what we're going to do now is look at our stencil code again, and this is um, what we're gonna look at. Uh, we're using some kind of streaming, so we're streaming, but also we're looking at this this new directive here, which is a pragma vector non-temporal. So, so this is kind of taking care of the caching non-temporal. So this is optimizing our locality and time. And we can see that this has kind of really improved the, the performance of it. Now we're going to go into the final part, which is the distributed computing part. Let's talk about this. So this is this basically is the MPI library. And we can use the MPI um, in combination with OpenMP. So OpenMP takes care of the threading and our M MPI takes care of the distributed computing. So that, that, that would be the, 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 the best kind of outcome. And what we this is a, a, a kind of way of passing messages. So how do we pass messages between the, the nodes in our cluster and the distributed computing? And there's certain design patterns to do that. So what you want to do is you want to avoid any, any kind of situation where you're going to have a race condition. So what we, the really kind of basic pattern is to use point to point communication. That rank could be a number like zero. The receiver could be numbered like one. So, and we've got this MPI send and we've got MPI receive. And we've got um, so some messages here, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, that's great. There's numerous kind of different design patterns that you can have. You can have parallel patterns. You can have um, collective communication. You can have broadcast, this is MPI broadcasting to different nodes. You can have collective communication scatter. You can have collective communication gather. You have collective communication reduction. So these are some kind of examples here. And if you look at here, we've kind of put in MPI rank, MPI size. And as, as we're running the code, we've got to run it in MPI run. We're running it with four nodes here. And so this is our cluster. And we've um, basically got our, our stencil here. And we've got our image here and then we're running it and this is the code that we've added on top of the code that was there before and this is a, a, allowing us to distribute the, the the process over these over these nodes and we get a massive just using four nodes we managed to massively increase the performance from you know 1,100 to 3,100. So this is this is absolutely fantastic example of how we can use you know just and this isn't we're not talking about being a performance engineer we're just talking about you know low hanging fruits um, and how, what we can do to improve the performance of our code of of our code and you know there there are numerous kind of valuable um, use cases where similar stuff can be done. So it's, it's extremely powerful technologies to become aware of. Um, of course, there are GPUs, there are FPGAs, um, but we, we can see that the, the CPUs are very powerful and there's many, use, there's many more use cases within finance that you can use. So I'm gonna stop the video here and I'm going to, the next video is gonna be on neuromorphic computing.